Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Let me give you some logistics to start off our message today. We are in a new series, and so it's going to take a little bit more time for me to uh, accomplish today's message to help launch this, this month of our, of our new series. And uh, we are talking about where do we grow from here, and this is all-encompassing. So this is vision, this is spiritual growth. If you've been interested in becoming a partner, if you've been interested in who Calvary is and what we do and how to get involved uh, or, or even just to join the church and say, hey, this is my home church, uh, this is it. This is the series. If you were to come to starting point for four weeks in our, in our uh, conference room, this is what you would hear. This is the heart that you would hear who we are as a church, how to get involved. So guess what? If you've been wanting to go to Starting Point and the past two years has just been insane, we created Starting Point right here as a church. Who are we? What are we up to? Where are we headed? And at the end of this month, we're going to have a partner interest meeting so you can know. And, and by the way, some of you already are partners. You just don't realize it. You haven't really you know, said, hey, let me, I do all the things you're saying. Let me join, go ahead and join the church. This is a chance for you to do that. And so at the end of this month, after the nine o'clock and 11 o'clock, we're going to have a partner interest meeting. And as well as that night on Zoom, for those who are at home and staying uh, home right now, we're going to have it as well. So we can answer questions and give you guidance on what we mean by partnership. So this, this message is really to help you hear the heart of God and what he has called us to do as Christians. And, you know, direction, direction on where to grow and where I'm going in life. And so that's my heart through this message, and I wanted to get those logistics out. And here's why. Again, the title is, Where Do We Grow From Here? Um, we are in this together as a church. And you're going to hear that today in the heart of this message. Here's something I learned. And let me get into the message. Here's something I learned throughout my, I don't know, I've been, I've been a Christian for a while, but I think I started recognizing how God works a little bit more. I'm still learning a lot. No one ever knows exactly how God works. We don't know his thoughts, his ways. I'm still learning that. But here's one thing I definitely have learned. I can't go where God is leading if I don't grow where it's needed. I can't go where God is leading if I don't grow where it's needed. God requires growth in character and faith so we can handle his purpose and plans for our lives. In other words, I wouldn't want to be where I am today when I first started ministry 15 years ago. I would need to grow. And God has brought me through a lot in my personal life. I wouldn't be able to handle the responsibilities or the call upon my life. You wouldn't be able to handle the destiny that God has for you if you haven't grown through this whole time. It's funny. We want to grab onto the destiny. We want to grab onto why we're here. But often we don't want to go through the process of being prepared. And God is here. And, and where do we grow from here? I'll tell you where we grow from here. We grow closer to God. We grow in understanding and maturing in Christ so that when we get to where we're supposed to be, we can handle what God gives us. That's, that's deep, isn't it? But it's true. And the same goes for our church. Our, our impact here at Calvary and all, all churches can only go as far as our spiritual growth allows. As healthy as our church is, as healthy as our reach will be. And so that's why we're doing this series together. And I want to help you understand how Calvary sees church. We look at it from Scripture, which is how it should be, right? We define church based on the Bible, not however we want to define it. So what is church? And what does it mean to be part of a church? And here's why. How you define church, believe it or not, determines the way you live. And not only the way you live, but the way you engage in your church. Well, how is that possible? Well, let me give you the definition of the word church. The New Testament commonly uses the word church, but in Greek, it is ekklesia, which means a called out assembly or congregation. So when used in the New Testament, ekklesia refers to a group of people, not brick, mortar, or even a Sunday worship service. No, it's referring to you and to me who are believers. We are the church. Let me give you a scripture foundation for that. Ephesians 2, 
19 through 22 says this, and this is Paul talking to those who weren't Jews, and now they're being included in the family of God. He says, so now you Gentiles, which is anyone who's not a Jew at that time, are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Listen to this beautiful line. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling place where God lives by his spirit. See, it can't be brick and mortar because the spirit doesn't enter concrete. The spirit enters us. We are the church. We attend church because that's what we call it in America, but we are the church, amen? Let me give you two more supporting scriptures so you don't think I'm just using one. There's plenty of them, but 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? Notice it says together. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you and I for a high price. Jesus dying on the cross. So you must honor God with your body or worship God with your body or your whole life. What's the implications of the scripture? You've already heard me say this. We are the church. We're carefully joined together in him. Jesus is the head. We are the body. We're connected to one another through salvation and baptism in Christ. That's why we lead people to Christ and then we water baptize them. Our honor, obedience, worship, and relationship with God begins before we ever turn to attend a church service on Sunday morning. Why? Because we are the temple. I, it used to crack me up when I was doing youth ministry for 11 years and a kid would slip up on the basketball court and say a cuss word and a kid would say, you just cussed in church. As a Christian, he is the church. So no matter where we are, we're supposed to honor God, right? So I had to teach him a little bit. Hey, be careful what you're saying. You know, you are the temple of God. So wherever you go, whatever you think, whatever you do, you worship God. The church, according to this scripture, is not confined to four walls because God's worth is not confined to four walls. Because God's glory, love, and mission and his people are not confined to a building. And then we have uh, a mission here on earth. God's kingdom on earth advances through the church, the fellowship of believers and disciples of Christ. And lastly, we have an important place and role in the church to contribute to the health and the advancement of its mission. This means as a pastor, or if you were an evangelist or an apostle or a teacher, uh, you were called and you are called to equip the saints for the work of ministry according to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. If I don't equip you, the, what the scripture says in the following, the last few verses is, is that you will be weak and immature and I don't want that. So I like to preach on Sundays, but I also like to teach on Wednesdays and, and equip you. But the responsibility as the church is that you come hungry to grow and be equipped as well, amen? That you come under teaching and leadership of the church and together we are the temple and it's, it's vital that we all know our role so that we grow from here. Amen? You can clap for that. That's all good. Praise the Lord. So I have the cornerstone here, which is Jesus. And this is how the church was built upon Jesus and the teachings of the prophets and the apostles, as our scripture said. Now, my son... He, uh, he's, he's 13 today. Today's his birthday. Connor, happy birthday, buddy. He's a young man in training. So he was trying to build a tower with, uh, you know, those like big Legos for kids when he was young. He was trying to build a tower and he just put one square down, you know, one cube. And then he tried to build this really tall tower and it kept falling over, bless his heart. And so I was like, what if, buddy, we build a stronger foundation on the bottom and then build the tower up from there? Do you think it could go higher? You know, at first he's kind of fighting me about it. You know, I like the way mine looks, you know. 
But then we started, we started building out a bigger foundation. And what happened was the bigger the foundation, guess how much more this tower could be? Guess how big it could be? And guess how tall it could get? You know, that's the same thing with us. We couldn't handle where we need to be if we don't grow in our foundation. The same thing with the church. If the church is not healthy, the church will not be effective. But here's the thing. Um, we are the church. So when God is talking about the church being healthy, he's not talking about nice painted walls and all those things. He's talking about us being strong and healthy. Why? So that we can go out and reach more people for Jesus Christ. So that's why we do Starting Point. That's why we're in this series right now. And I want to share with you a story that I really feel like is important for us to hear. I was in a coffee shop about four years ago, and I'm studying the Bible and working on a sermon. And two ladies came in, and I've never seen them before. I don't know them. I've never seen them again. And they sat right behind me as I'm reading my word, as I'm pray praying and preparing for Sunday's message. And, um, I'm, and I'm hearing them talk, and the meeting seems serious. And it's one lady's leaving their church, and the other one's listening on why she's leaving. And that happens. You know, sometimes we need to find a place where God is going to preach his word and God, you know, right? The people are serving, the people are active. And so sometimes there are healthy transitions. The only thing is, is when I was listening, this was not good. And I couldn't help it. She's right behind me. <laughs> They're right behind me. And so I'm hearing this entire conversation. And uh, I heard her say that, well, one of the reasons why I'm leaving is because the pastor told me that I'm supposed to also learn the Bible, but that's why, I, that's why he's there. He's supposed to teach me the Bible. <laughs> and I'm like, well, he's, he's right. According to Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and many other scriptures that we're supposed to know the word of God. And, and so I don't think he's wrong. In fact, what time is his services? You know, I'm kind of interested to hear. He sounds like a good pastor. And then it hit me. She may not know that because she doesn't read the Bible. She waits for Sundays for the pastor to tell her what the scripture says. But here's the thing. The pastor isn't just the church, so is she. This is a misunderstanding of what the church is. It's not Sunday mornings only. It's you and me worshiping God. It's you and me being connected to the Lord. It's you and me learning, yes. I wasn't mad, I wasn't grossed out by it, I was actually burdened by it. It was a lesson. Wow, I need to teach Calvary to make sure they're thinking properly. I've been doing that for many years, Pastor Kuhn has. Thank the Lord, you guys come hungry for teaching and equipping, thank you. Because it makes my job and my calling a little easier. I thank you for that. By the way, if, you, if you've never seen me bear my soul, this is what it looks like. And I know that when I do bear my soul, that makes me very vulnerable. And I'm letting you hear and see what I think about behind the scenes. But I want to be real with you as a pastor, okay? Because there's too many fake, there's too much fake leadership out there in our world. And I want to be transparent with you. Well, the conversation turned a little more like bashing the church and the pastor. So I grabbed my headphones, put them in, and I carried on with my study. They never noticed I was there. They never saw that my Bible was open. And that was something that I took that day to go, okay, let's make sure we equip every saint <laughs> to know their role in the church. So that's the foundation that now I have to preach two points on. Are you ready? All right, buckle up because it's going to be quick. I already did the, uh, did, I did the full sermon last service, so I can't split it up today. So bear with me, buckle in. Let's make this happen. At Calvary, what's really important to us is we worship God. It's also where I grow. It's where you grow. It's where we all should grow. In Isaiah 45, 5, this is why it was fitting what we heard from our brother in Christ today during the service. Isaiah 45, 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you though, though you have not acknowledged me. Well, Ryan, that's really negative, but I, I gotta give you what the word says. The, the people of God they know 
that there's no other God, but they haven't been acting like it, and they've actually been creating other idols and, and crafting things and looking to other gods because surrounding nations have believed there's other gods. I have a news flash for you, and I know this can be offensive, and it might, it's not a news flash for this church, you've heard me say this. For anyone who may be new who don't know this, here's the reality. There is no other God except God. The lies of the devil is, let's put a bunch of more options on the menu so that everyone's confused and doesn't know who to believe. That's a devil scheme. The truth is, there's only one God. There was only one God for them. Only one God delivered them from slavery through Red Seas, fed them for 40 years, and now they're not even acknowledging him. Worship is to acknowledge God in all he has done for you because there is no other God. God is calling us today to change and to worship him. To worship is to give oneself, your whole self, your heart, your life, and praise. And our strong conviction here at Calvary is there is no other God that deserves all of our worship because there is no other God at all. This means that we certainly don't do something else then. This means that we don't worship ourselves. This means that we don't make life about us, but meanwhile, society says, have a hyper-focus on self, you do you. It's a lie, isn't it? We don't even know what we wanna eat after church. I don't know if you wanna trust your own decisions at times. Okay, that's a little exaggeration, but you know. Our creator should say what we should do, not the created. So we worship God. Here's the thing. Let's go a little deeper. We can't handle worship and glory. Because that belongs to the creator, not the created. We would crumble when someone rejects us and doesn't give us the love and affection that we want. In fact, we are in our society because we want it to be all about us. So you see, when we, when we get too much worship, now, now we become prideful. And now it's all about us. And then when someone doesn't show us the attention, the affection, and the love that we're supposed to get because you want them to worship you and love you more than anyone else, when you don't get it, now rejection sets in. And now rejection means I have to fall apart because your life is built upon yourself and not upon the foundation, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm a little excited. I've been holding this series in for a long time. There's things I won't post on Facebook because I don't have all day to go through the dialogue, but I will bring to this sermon. So if we get too much of uh, people worshiping us, we become prideful. If we don't get enough, we get rejected. Here's the thing, God can handle both. He can handle rejection. And to be honest with you, he's supposed to be worshiped. But he's such a loving, selfless God. He still cares about those who are far from him that even if they reject him, he still calls them to come back to him like we heard in the word today. Praise the Lord. This also means that since we are the church and we're called to worship him, we can worship him before we ever come to church and we should we worship him with our whole life. And then, because we don't worship ourselves and we worship God, when we come to gather, we don't do it to bring attention to ourselves by how we worship or how we dress or our conduct here or our conduct and our dress in, in groups. We come here to bring attention to God. God should get all the glory and all the praise through our worship. Now, here's the thing about that. That does not mean that your genuine various expressions of God should be judged wrongfully. But the great judge, God, sees your heart, knows your motive, and that it's done in spirit and in truth, then praise the Lord. You know what? There should be shouts of joy in this place. There should be words from the Lord and, and gifts of the spirit being operated, but it all must be done in spirit and in truth, not to bring attention to ourselves. Amen? This is the worship of God in churches and here especially in Calvary. Worship is a lifestyle. Romans 12, one through two. Therefore, I urge you, 
brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're supposed to worship as a lifestyle, not just a few songs on Sunday. 1 John 2, 6, what does that look like then? Well, a very convicting verse. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. We encourage our church to aim, because you don't, you don't ever be Jesus because you're not Jesus, but our aim, because if you aim at nothing, you hit nothing, right? You've heard that saying. Our aim is to be like Jesus, to follow his example in the whole, our whole life and throughout the week because we wanna be authentic worshipers of God. We don't copy the behaviors of this world. We don't try to fit the customs of this world. We are a called out people, sanctified. The church has been separated from the world through the Holy Spirit. So we're not supposed to match them. We're supposed to be different. And our best example of that is Jesus Christ. And he did it in such a masterful way. He was honest and truthful, but he was loving and gracious at the same time. When you get that figured out, you call me because I'm still trying to figure that out too. Because <laughs> you know what it is? It's a lifelong journey of learning how to live that out. It is. But here's the thing. So if we don't worship ourselves, saying a lifestyle of worship is, is following Jesus, then we need Jesus and he's the word and so is the word, the scriptures, the Bible. So here's an important takeaway for you. We don't change the Bible to be who we want. We let the Bible shape us into the life God wants. And the implications of these verses that we're reading today is, is that God isn't a part of our lives. He is our life. We don't fit God into our life. When we worship God and God alone and not ourselves and not other people, God gets first place and everything else has to fall in order. Even in the decisions that we make in life. And there's this thinking in our society that, that we can have a little bit of Jesus and then a little bit of this world. That is not what scripture teaches. God is not an ornament in your walk of life. God is not a, a, a piece of your agenda. God is your agenda. God should dictate how you speak and how you think and how you should love and how you should live. Same thing with me, right? All day. That is God. But what I'm seeing, what has moved into our Christian circles and our church circles is that we add God on to the life we're living. You will break under that. You will fall apart because what's gonna happen is you're gonna do something that the world wants you to do and then you're gonna get into the word and you're gonna see that he, he says don't do that and now you're confused and you're trying to marry the two together but we are not, we are set apart, we are sanctified, we are different because we're the church of Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ doesn't try to add the world with God, the church of Jesus Christ follows God. Wow, this is some, whew, the Spirit of God is giving some heavy stuff for us. But you know what? It's serious to be a part of a church. It's serious to be the church. It's so important. Guess what else we do in worship? We sing. We sing. Ryan, I'm not a very good singer. It's okay. We just won't put you on stage to sing in front of everyone, okay? We'll help you out. But you know what? We're supposed to sing. We're supposed to express our worship in different forms. Psalm 96, one through four says, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. You're not just singing to sing, you're praising him. You're declaring things, ready? Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. We get to do that now because we have the internet. We get to publish good things about God all day if we want. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. Little G, because there is no other God. We, we sing. 
We come to church to sing of the praises and the goodness and the character and the glory of God. And when we do it together, we realize it doesn't matter what we look like, what our background is. We are one body, one nation under God, one group of people, the church of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter where you come from. Amen. So all of this begins in your own private life, but it also grows and is part of being part of the church and so with people. So what's our next core value at Calvary? The first one is we worship God and especially alone and no one else and no, nothing else. But the second thing is the importance of coming together. We come together. We get together. We meet together. However you want to pronounce it, we grow together. Acts 2, 42 through 47 that's going to be our main text for this point. Acts 2, 42 through 47. Beautiful scripture of example of the church when it first started. It says, All the believers devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Powerful words. They met together. All of them were devoted. They did the Lord's Supper. They worshiped. They heard the teaching of the scriptures. They shared, they were generous. They were part of the mission of God. That is exactly what Calvary is all about. And they were consistent with it, whether they met at the temple or they met in their homes. And the reason why is because they are the church. Now, here's the thing about this. Um, why, would, why would the last verse say that God added to their fellowship daily those who are being saved? I have a biblical pastoral hunch. You ready? because they were a trustworthy church to send new believers to, or a trustworthy church to send unsaved people to, because they knew when they got there, God knew that when they got there, they would be taken care of, that they would hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that when they got saved, they would be part of the community and loved and taken care of and taught the scriptures and would be uh, ministered to and be taught as well to go make disciples in other words, God saw a church worth growing. God saw his, his ministry working, and he said, I'll add people to that church because God builds his church. We are part of it, but God ultimately builds his church. Praise the Lord. Let me use this, this cornerstone as an example. This cornerstone represents Jesus. These are like us. These are just, this is just a visual image. We used Ephesians 2, that we are the temple. So I'm using these blocks as a, as a visual. This is me, or this is you. Do you think that we should, uh, let me ask you a question. Which one would you rather the church be built on? That big cornerstone, Jesus, or you? Right? That's an obvious answer. And every good science school answer is Jesus. Yeah. Again, the church cannot be built on people first or one person. It cannot be built on one pastor. It will crumble. The pressure and the weight and the burden would destroy that person. It can't be built just on you. We are the church built upon the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And that's why the church will prevail it falls apart when it's not built on Jesus. Amen. God will add to the church. That's why people are driving by this church and we have a long ways to go, but we're growing in this way. And that's why people have said, I've driven by your church and I felt God say, come, come to this church, come attend this church. And I was like, wow, that's cool. God help us to be a church worthy of unbelievers that need you. Help us to be a church that's ready to take on new believers and help them grow and love on them. Well, how do we do that? Our next scripture, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. You're doing so good hanging in with me. Hang on. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Let us think of ways 
to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, typically churches and pastors like me would like to drive home verse 25. Don't stop meeting together. Don't neglect. Make sure you keep coming to church. Now, here's the thing. Now that you understand that we are the church, what he's trying to say here is don't stop, don't, don't miss being together with the church. Not just attending. I want you to attend on Sunday. Trust me. I'm not, I know this might sound funny coming from me. Trust me. I'm saying attend Sundays because we're here. God's here, right? What he's saying here is, is don't neglect meeting with one another. But that's actually not the point. Put that scripture back up real quick. Verse 24 is the point. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Verse 25 near the end, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return, the end, is drawing near. The purpose isn't just to come together so we can warm each other up with body heat. The purpose isn't that, you know, we just come around each other and now we're near each other. That's not the power of Jesus Christ working to the church. The church is powerful because we think of ways to motivate one another towards love and good deeds. Because we encourage one another. That's where church comes alive. That was Acts 2, 42 through 47. Can you tell I'm excited? Because I've seen this, I've experienced it, and I've seen it at this church. And let me tell you though, we don't have enough time on Sunday morning to apply that. And neither did they. That's why they didn't just meet at the temple. They met in each other's homes to encourage and do the Lord's Supper and to pray and to serve one another. In fact, there was no central building at this time in Hebrews chapter 10 for them to meet. So they divided into their homes and they worshiped God. It wasn't about where they were. It was about who they were with. God is calling us to grow in this area. And you know what this scripture implies? This scripture implies that we have something to give out. Because it says, let us encourage one another. Let us spur in the NIV. Let us kind of, you know, provoke in a good way. Let's inspire each other, okay, towards love and good deeds to be like Jesus. You know what that means? That you have to have Jesus in you to do that. That you have to be doing good works and encouraging others throughout the week. You have to be obeying scripture We don't come to the fellowship empty. We come filled with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm gonna say something about those who may have a hard week, but hold on for a second. Colossians 3, 16 says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Why? Then you can teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Just so you know, that was talking to the body of Christ, not just to another pastor. Teach and counsel one another. We're meant to teach each other. We're meant to encourage. We're meant to inspire one another. But the source has to be Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, where do you get that, Ryan? Um, There's no download on the internet for that. That would be great. Um, I, I only, the only way I can come here on a Sunday morning or lead a group or have a meeting with another person in the church is if I'm hanging out with God first because he is first because I worship him first. I, I have to have a healthy relationship with God throughout the week. I have to fellowship with God in order for me to not, to not be a hypocrite and then come to the church and act like I have something to give and I don't. When we genuinely worship God and genuinely get with God, he will overflow out of our lives. He will be coming off the brim and off the brim and and, and drenching others around you. I am so inspired by some of your worship, some of the things that God is doing in your life. The, The testimonies I get through my email or in my groups, they encourage me to keep going because we're supposed to. We're supposed to live a Christian life way before we come together. And then we're supposed to get together to help each other keep moving forward. That is what this scripture is teaching. It's, and it's not just on Sunday morning. And by the way, if we want Sunday morning to be more like this, 
we had, a, we had a practical action step on Wednesday night at our Together training, which I invite you out to learn more about this topic. The practical action step is this. Come to church 15 minutes early, stay about 15 minutes late, as long as you don't, you know, irritate the kids' workers and the nursery workers. If they're hearing me, I'm sorry. Stay a little bit. Go get your kids, then come back. The point is, is it's hard to have quality personal time where we can hear that someone had a rough week and pray for them and encourage them if we're coming in and then we just walk out. Now, Sunday mornings in America and uh, in, in Christian churches, unfortunately, it hasn't been designed to do that. So if we can improve in any way, it would be that we hang out in the lobbies and hear each other out, because here's why. Well, Ryan, what if I don't come to church with everything put together? Should I come? Yes, because we're not perfect. Because we need, that's the point. That was the point. You don't encourage someone who's already encouraged. I mean, yeah, you can. You can keep pushing people towards love, good deeds, yes. But there's people that will come to church broken, discouraged, troubled, nothing to give. Should I come? Yes. Because you'll find the church of Jesus Christ filled with Jesus to reinvigorate and encourage you and motivate you and tell you the truth that God loves you and he's rebuilding you. That's what you'll find at this church, I hope and I pray. Amen. I need to wrap this up. How you define church, I'm going to say it again. How you define church determines the way you live and engage in your church. You may have not realized that because maybe the pastors in our world have not taught that. But you cannot escape that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of his church. And therefore, you are a benefit to the church. You're meant to bring life and encouragement. And then we're meant to be there for each other when we're struggling. That's the point because this world is hard and people have been through some hard things. And man, if, if you're waiting till Sunday to hear from God, don't do that, don't do that. And you don't have to wait until Sunday to hear encouragement from another believer. Let's get together. Can I ask us to not, to not wait for Pastor Ryan to orchestrate a training to get together? Can we just do it? Can we care and love people in this room starting here? Because the Bible says they will know you are my disciples when you love one another. John 13, 34 and 35. Can we start right here, reach across the aisle or stay a little longer and, and care for one another and get to know each other? And then we'll know how to pray and encourage and motivate one another towards love and good deeds. You know, what is, you know what's sad? Is that the church in America is not even applying that scripture in both ways. They're not getting together like we used to. And when we do get together, we're not doing what we're supposed to. God is calling us to change. You heard it today from our brother in Christ. God is calling the church to change. Why? Because changes are a coming right here in our world. He's on his way. Change has already happened in our society. The devil wants you to stay away from the church, family of God. He doesn't want you to come on Sunday morning. He doesn't want you to come to a group. He doesn't want you to be part of another believer because if you do, you'll get encouraged. You'll get motivated to obey. You'll get prayed for. Mm. Holy Spirit's speaking today. Come back to him first. Worship him and come be with his church. We need to be ready. As the day approaches and is drawing near, we must be together to love and encourage one another because it's going to get harder. That's just the reality. It's going to get harder. Are you ready to be all in? These are two ways we begin to be all in at Calvary. We worship God and we come together to be all in together. Can you imagine what church is going to be like on Sunday morning at 9 and 11 if we're being with God all week and we've been with other believers all week, oh my goodness. This place will be packed. We, there will be, we will have to stretch the service times out. 
we'll have to pray for our nursery and children's workers because they need help. We're going to have, there's going to be things happen. But here's the thing. Everyone puts all the eggs in the Sunday morning basket. No, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. No, no, we're going to leave here and you're going to be doing life as the church all week and we're going to be changing lives in Delaware. We're going to see lives change for Christ. Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand together as we pray here? We have action steps for this week on this little card. You can find them on your way out in our lobby. And if we could have some of our ushers and greeters have these ready at the doors, that'd be fantastic. I think they already are. Anyone get this yet already? Okay, so we have, we have cards that help you know how some next steps you can make. We have Right Now Media on our website so you can keep growing in, in your faith. Groups can use it. Uh, you can join a group. You can come to my Together training this Wednesday night at seven right here in this room. And then we'll be together to apply our scripture today, worshiping God and coming together for prayer tonight. So you can see all that on the card. Thanks for hanging in to hear God's word today. And um, thank you for being a church that loves the truth. It, it makes it a little bit easier as a pastor to bring the word. And you guys have been an amazing, amazing church. Thank you for that. Let's pray. God, man, your word, there's so much to apply. God, I pray you would help us to apply even one point today. Where do we grow from here, God? We grow closer to you. We grow in our worship. And God, we grow together. God, we grow by coming together and, and doing what your word says. Lord, people have brought things in today that they've needed to hear this or God, maybe we've had wrong ideas of what church is and wrong teaching. And then some, we just need people. Or maybe our worship's been directed somewhere else and not towards you. God, realign us today. Realign us according to your word. Tune us to be in a place where we're worshiping you. Tune this church, God, to grow and to be together. God, I pray that you would use your church today to encourage the body that's struggling today. Lord, we've all been there and we're supposed to be there for each other. Help us to do that, God. Help us to, to spend adequate time as the day approaches where you're drawing near and coming near. Your second coming is on the way. So God, I pray you would strengthen us as a church. Thank you, God, for our church online. Thank you, God, for what you're doing online. Lord, thank you for the salvation last week of a young lady. And now her family members are discipling her every week as she listens to this sermon today in Pennsylvania. We thank you for what you're doing at home. God, surround her with a body of Christ, with other believers, Lord, that are gonna help her grow. Thank you for the family. Lord, you're working in ways we don't even see or know. We thank you for that. Work in us today. As we go our separate ways, may we remember we are one, though, as the church. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer today or if you need to talk to anyone, we'll be down here at the front to pray over you. God bless you. Have a great Sunday and a great week.